lesson is the story of Pentecost. It's from the second chapter of Acts. If you want to follow along, it's on page 885 in your Bibles, and the three of us are going to read. Listen to God's word as it comes from Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, and by God's living spirit, a word for us today. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All, All of them, them were filled with the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit and, and began, began to speak in other languages, languages as, as the, the Spirit, Spirit gave them ability. ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are, are not, not all, all these who are speaking Galileans? Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us, each of us, each of us, in, in our, our own, own native, native language? language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, residents of Crete and Arabs. In, In our, our own, own languages, languages we, we hear, hear them speaking, speaking about, about God's deeds of power. power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What, what does, does this mean? mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. People of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then, then everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Find in your bulletin, the spirit of the living God, remain seated. Sing it again without the organ. Here we go. Spirit of the
You can find on page 508 in your pew Bible, if you would like, Psalm 150, or you can pull out the insert. I have a few languages on there, so if one of them happens to be very familiar or your native tongue, I invite you to feel free to speak it. We are not going to read this together. We are going to read it, speak it, say it, as the Spirit moves. One of us will start, and feel free to join in whenever you're inclined, at whatever pace you want, and we'll let it finish as the Spirit moves. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals, praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Will you pray with me? Holy God, bless us as we ponder your word. that your spirit might indeed dwell richly in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Finally, Jesus' words in the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. His final speech with his disciples, he's, he's about to leave. Listen, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas said to them, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but it is from the Father who sent me. I've said these things to you that while I'm still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Recall a conversation with a man in his latter years. A man of faith who who lived well, who thoughtfully, lived carefully and and joyfully and prudently. And and as we talked about his closing days, he told me of one of his great concerns. He said, you know, my parents had it better than their parents. It was the same for me. My my siblings and I had better lives than our mom and dad. We, We had more. We did more. We were more educated. We worried less. And that's probably true for two of my three children, he told me, my daughters. Not so much for my son. He's a good man, but for some reason he just never seemed to be able to get ahead. I look at my grandchildren and I wonder if most of them will lose a rung on the ladder of life instead of gaining. But but what I'm most afraid of is that I will end up spending all that I have saved all of it on medical care or nursing home and there will be nothing left particularly for my son who really has no resources to fall back on and I thought for a bit and and I and I asked him do you do your children know that you love them (laughs) oh 
Oh, yes, he said they certainly do. We, we say that, I love you, to, to each other every time we talk. Well, do your daughters love their brother, I asked. Well, absolutely. They, they care a great deal about him, and, and they told me not to worry about him. Down the road, if he needs help, they will be there for him. Well, I asked, have your kids been through hardship and, and come through without giving up or destroying those around them or abandoning a decent pathway along their journey? Well, yes, he said, certainly. They, they've been there, done that, like most of us. And, and they've come through still loving, still caring, still productive, not bitter or mean-spirited. I said, well, it, it sounds like their inheritance from you is more than sufficient, regardless of what's in the bank account on your last day. Jesus is leaving the disciples, and this is his great bequest my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. How does that happen? It's by his spirit. Jesus is leaving in bodily form so that Jesus can come in spirit. I'm sending to you what my father promised. He said the comfort of the advocate, the, the spirit. But this, this is not some new and different spirit. This is his spirit. And the same spirit of Jesus that invited his followers into bonds of friendship while Jesus was here. The same spirit of Jesus that enlivened them in a love that burst through the limits of their society's rules about who belonged and who didn't. A spirit of healing and hope and joy that was alive in Jesus. It is his spirit, that same spirit that he is sending. I don't know where I got the idea, but somewhere along the line I had this thought that, that the Holy Spirit was like some separate force come to mess with me from the outside in. When in fact, this is God's spirit, the same spirit that was in Christ, who lives in, in you and me. I mean, it's Jesus' spirit which enables you and me now, today, to be the embodiment of Jesus Christ in the world. The Apostle Paul says, it's not me, it's Christ within me. When I'm at my best, when I'm aligned with God, it's Jesus at work within me. God, who by his power at work within me is able to do infinitely more than I could dare to ask or imagine or dream or think of. That's when I'm in God's will. I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you, Jesus says. The Father and I will come and make our home with you. This is not somebody else's spirit, some other kind of spirit. This is Jesus' spirit. My spirit, he says, my love, my generosity, my hospitality. That's who comes to live in us. Think about it. I'm in the spirit of Christ. A letter to the Colossians we'll study later this summer tells us, Christ, in, in whom and through whom all things were created, in whom the world finds its very purpose and its center, in whom all things have their being. That's the Spirit through whom you and I find our peace, peace with ourselves and love for the world in which we're set. And you and I know what that Spirit is like. And we, we know when it's not the one that's at work in us. Because Jesus' spirit is not a mean spirit. 
but a spirit of care. It's not a spirit of hatred, but a spirit of love. It's, a, it's not a spirit of self-centeredness, but a spirit of self-sacrifice, self-emptying for the sake of the other, for the sake of the good. They'll know we are Christians by our love. We'll walk with each other, work with each other, guard each one's dignity. That's what the spirit of Christ looks like. That's what it's like when Jesus is living in you and me. (laughs) It's not you and me trying to be like Jesus. It's you and me getting out of the way and letting the Jesus in us do what Jesus does. The guy in in the opening illustration reminds me of my own dad. And all of the things, the legacies that he's given me, and you've heard a lot of them in sermons, but I realize my dad was at his best. My dad is at his best when he gets out of the way and lets Jesus love, live in him. That's the spirit. The spirit of the living God who falls afresh, who who loves the whole world, the the spirit of Christ, who welcomes the stranger, who sees in every poor lost soul the one sheep that God is searching for, the spirit of Christ who sees in every lonely, every outcast, every imprisoned one, a child of God to be loved to wholeness. That is the spirit that's promised to us. And how do I know what that looks like? All you got to do is look at scripture and what happened after Pentecost. It says they met together and they worshiped together and they ate together and they prayed together and they shared all things. They had all things in common with one another in ways they had never ever weren't allowed to do. I mean, male and female. Worship together, prayed together, ate together, met together. Male and female, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, Roman citizen and Pharisee, Republican and Democrat, Northerner and Southerner, urban and rural, young and old. They were all together because all their own stuff had gotten out of the way and the living Christ met the living Christ in each one. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Invite that Jesus again to come alive in your life, that his spirit might be what comes forth. And if that's that's not the spirit that's alive or at work in you, then maybe you need to ask him to come in a new way or to come afresh or to, to just really come and dwell in you in power. For that's how the world will know him. When they see him. When they see us. May it be so. Amen.